All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we're gonna to be talking about peroxisomes and peroxisomal disorders. Before we get started though, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe, subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account, go check all those out. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so we're gonna start talking about the function of peroxisomes. We talked a little bit about them in the structure and function of the cell video, but we're gonna kinda of elaborate on those functions a little bit more. So one really big function of the peroxisomes is that they play a role in fatty acid metabolism. You know there's particular types of fatty acids, uh, what's called very long chain fatty acids. So very long chain fatty acids, very long chain fatty acids. And then there's other ones which are called branch chain fatty acids. So branch chain fatty acids. These molecules, okay, are brought into peroxisomes through very special transporters. And these transporters, these blue proteins here, they're called ABCD1 transporters. So ABCD1 transporters. And these are very important because we need these in order to get these fatty acids into the peroxisome. Now, once these fatty acids are brought into the peroxisome, what happens to them? Well, let's focus on the very long chain fatty acids first. Once you bring these very long chain fatty acids into this peroxisome, it undergoes a process called beta oxidation. If you guys have watched our biochemistry videos, you guys remember what that's called and what happens there. We take the fatty acid and through a series of four steps, you guys can remember that via the mnemonic OHOT, and that was oxidation, hydration, so you're adding in water, another oxidation step, and then one more step which is called a thiolase activity or thiolation. These are the, act, the actual steps within the beta oxidation pathway. So what is this pathway called? This is the beta oxidation pathway. Very important. And then what happens is as the, at the end result of this beta oxidation pathway, you generate acetyl-CoA's. Okay, and these acetyl-CoA molecules can be just kind of like, remember, you're taking these fatty acids and chopping off two carbons at a time. So the remaining amounts, you're actually going to get two molecules out of this. You'll get acetyl-CoA, but the other molecules that you'll get out of this is called acyl-CoAs, which are just basically the remaining of the very long chain fatty acids after they've been broken down. The ACL-CoA's can just go back up to this step and then re-go through it again. So it's just a consistent process, a consistent cycle, if you will. Now, this process is very important within the peroxisomes. And one of the reasons why is in the actual pro during this process, this beta oxidation, you generate a particular molecule from the oxidation step. You generate a molecule called hydrogen peroxide. And that's very interesting. So the more very long chain fatty acids that get beta oxidized into acetyl-CoA and ACL-CoAs, the more hydrogen peroxide you generate. That's the first step I want you to remember. So the first function is beta oxidation within the peroxisomes. The second function is you bring these next ones in, these uh, branch chain fatty acids. And branch chain fatty acids can get converted into very long chain fatty acids. So you're just basically cutting off these little branches and then they are very long chain fatty acids that undergo beta oxidation and do the same process. But this step here where you go from branch chain fatty acids to very long chain fatty acids is called alpha oxidation. So very important there. All right, so two things that we've already seen within the peroxisomes. One is the beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids, and the second one is alpha oxidation of branch chain fatty acids. Ba-boom. All right, you know another function of the peroxisomes? There's another really interesting one. You can thank your peroxisomes for this. You know when you're uh, getting a little bit of red wine in you, you know, a little bit of loud mouth soup in you, there's a little uh, molecule within that called ethanol. And ethanol is actually metabolized by you know, they can be metabolized in your smooth endoplasmic reticulum, but also within your peroxisomes. So ethanol can get taken into these peroxisomes. And when they're taken into the peroxisomes, they actually get broken down, right, into a particular molecule here called acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde. Aldehyde. And that's important. And the reason why is in this actual peroxisome, remember this molecule, this H2O2 molecule? 
Well, we can actually use some of this hydrogen peroxide molecules in this step. And through that, we generate water and we generate oxygen. Right? And in this step here, it's just the opposite. So whenever you're utilizing very long chain fatty acids to make acetyl-CoA molecules and acyl-CoAs, guess what you're putting into the reaction? Water and oxygen. And as a result, you're generating hydrogen peroxide. Same thing in this ethanol metabolism, when you break down ethanol into acetaldehyde, you utilize hydrogen peroxide and generate water and oxygen. This would be the third function of the peroxisomes is ethanol metabolism. The fourth function of the actual uh, peroxisomes is you have bile acids, but these bile acids, they're not activated, okay? So we're gonna call these bile acid intermediates. What happens is these bile acid intermediates have to get taken up into the peroxisome. And through these uh, particular enzymes present within the peroxisomes, they help to activate these bile acids. So then you get activated bile acids. And these activated bile acids can then be released from the peroxisomes and then go out to like the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So this is gonna be the fourth function of what? The peroxisomes, which is bile acid activation and metabolism. All right, the next function, the fifth function. You know whenever you take these acetyl-CoA molecules with that comes from this uh, beta oxidation process, you know what you can do with these? You can take these acetyl-CoA molecules, combine them with multiple acetyl-CoA molecules, and synthesize cholesterol. Now, cholesterol is not completely synthesized in the actual peroxisomes. They actually are made, a, a good chunk of cholesterol is actually made up, a, per, a particular intermediate of cholesterol is made in the peroxisomes, and then it gets sent to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which completely leads to the formation of cholesterol. But again, big thing to take away from this is that peroxisomes help in aiding in the synthesis of cholesterol. So this would be the fifth function is cholesterol synthesis. Now, what is the significance of cholesterol? We can use this in our cell membrane, right? It's very important for kind of maintaining fluidity in the cell membrane, especially with temperature changes. And it's important for steroid hormones. It's important for steroid hormones, such as testosterone, estrogen, all of these different molecules. And you know what else it's important for? Making bile acids. So again, really important thing to remember here is that the peroxisomes help in the formation of cholesterol. They don't completely make it in the peroxisomes. They lead to the formation of particular intermediates that then get shipped to the smooth ER, which help to finish that up and make the cholesterol. And again, the cholesterol is important for cell membrane component, steroid hormones, and bile acids. That's the fifth function. The sixth function is a very interesting one. You know these ACL-CoAs, they're just basically fatty acids. Okay, so essentially we can just kind of call these like fatty acids. They're just kind of like remaining pieces of these very long chain fatty acids after they underwent, underwent beta oxidation. These fatty acids, you can combine them with a particular molecule that your actual peroxisomes can take up. You know, uh, there's a molecule called glycerol, and glycerol eventually gets converted into a molecule called dihydroxyacetone phosphate. I know you guys remember that from glycolysis, right? So once dihydroxyacetone phosphate combines with some of these fatty acids, guess what it makes? It makes a particular type of phospholipid. You know what phospholipid this is? This is called plasmalogen. Plasmalogen is very important. You want to know why? Because it's incorporated into myelin. What is myelin important for? It's important for forming the actual myelin sheaths within nerves of your central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So that is very important when it comes to the components of the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, particularly myelinating the axons there. So this would be which function? This would be the sixth function is plasmalogen synthesis, which is important for myelin and neurons. The last function, and probably one of the more interesting functions here, is the relationship with free radicals. So you've already noticed one free radical that's kind of getting produced a lot, especially with this fatty acid oxidation. You're producing a lot of these hydrogen peroxides. And also, you know from your electron transport chain, your electron transport chain also generates a lot of free radicals. And if you guys remember your kind of free radical reactions here, like you can take, for example, oxygen, and then from certain types of processes, you can get converted into a superoxide anion. That superoxide can get converted into hydrogen peroxide. 
and then hydrogen peroxide can get converted into a hydroxyl free radical. Why is this important? Because these molecules right here, the uh, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl, free radic uh, hydroxyl molecule are free radicals. You know why free radicals are damage, uh, damaging and dangerous? These molecules here can bind onto DNA, they can bind onto proteins, and they can bind onto lipids. And then they're going to damage the DNA, damage the proteins, and damage these lipids. And you know what these are important for? Our cell membrane, our organelles. And if these get damaged, it really causes a lot of cellular dysfunction. So thankfully and beautifully, our actual, what? Our peroxisomes has a beautiful enzyme that takes this hydrogen peroxide and converts it into water and oxygen. What is this molecule that we should be so thankful for? This molecule is called catalase. So this is called catalase. So all of this hydrogen peroxide that's being built up within the cell from what processes? From the beta oxidation pathway and coming from electron transport chain. And remember that this hydrogen peroxide will get converted into water and oxygen, which is going to prevent the buildup of hydrogen peroxide, which leads to free radical damage. So again, what is the seventh and final function? The seventh and final function is this catalase activity, which reduces hydrogen peroxide buildup and therefore free radical damage. All right, engineers, so now that we understand the function of peroxisomes, this, this is really going to be helpful to understand these peroxisomal disorders. Now, you might be like, why the heck do I need to know this? This is very, very important for your USMLE Step 1 exams. So it's very important that you truly understand peroxisomal function because it'll help you to understand the peroxisomal disorders. There's a particular condition called Zellweger syndrome. And Zellweger syndrome, the first thing that you need to know that's very important is that it is autosomal recessive. It is autosomal recessive. So you need two kind of mutant alleles basically, uh, particularly for a, a specific gene. And that gene is called the PEX gene. And whenever you have this autorecessive disorder, you don't express the PEX gene. Why is that important? Because the PEX gene codes for particular proteins called peroxins that are in essential to making peroxisomes. So if you don't make PEX, if you don't express PEX genes, you don't make proteins that lead to the formation of peroxisomes. So there's a decrease in peroxisomes. Ooh, so now all we gotta remember is everything that the peroxisomes did. What did they do? They broke down fatty acids. If they can't break them down because they're not there, what happens? You accumulate an increase in very long chain fatty acids. You increase the accumulation of branch chain fatty acids. What else? It broke down ethanol. Well, you can't break down ethanol, so now you're gonna have an accumulation of ethanol. Then what else? You weren't able to break down the hydrogen peroxide into water, so you accumulate hydrogen peroxide. And also, if you, don't, if you forget, that you won't be able to synthesize cholesterol, plasmalogen, all of those good things. So, if that's the case, then guess what happens? This hydrogen peroxide, very long chain fatty acids, branch chain fatty acids, ethanol, all accumulate within particular tissues and cause damage and affliction to these tissues. You can remember this by neurohepatorenal syndrome. When it ends up kind of accumulating within the tissues in the central nervous system, this leads to neurodegeneration that presents with hypotonia, which is kind of like really floppy uh, kind of muscles. And this is very common in babies. It causes like a floppy baby syndrome. And also it can lead to seizures, okay? So this is another important thing. When it accumulates in the liver, it causes the, the actual liver to not be able to process bilirubin as well. So bilirubin, a pigment in the blood, actually accumulates and leads to jaundice. Because that bilirubin starts depositing in the skin and in the eyes, the sclera particularly. It also can affect the way that the actual kidneys, the tubules are developing within the actual urinary system. And this can lead to polycystic kidney disease. Very important, very high yield to know this condition. All right, the next condition is called Refsum's disease. Refsum's disease is also an autosomal recessive disorder. And it leads to decreased expression or loss of expression for genes involved in alpha oxidation. Remember that alpha oxidation pathway? 
What happened in the alpha oxidation pathway? You took a molecule called a branch chain fatty acid, and through the process of alpha oxidation, we'll just put there as alpha ox, you break that branch chain fatty acid into what kind of molecule? A very long chain fatty acid, okay? And if you don't do that, then these branch chain fatty acids will build up within the actual tissues. What tissues will it build up in? It'll build up within the, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, the skin, and within the epiphyseal plates. What will that lead to? If it accumulates within the central nervous system, this really loves to damage the cerebellum. This leads to ataxia. It loves to damage the actual nerves. You know you have the actual peripheral nerves that come out here? It loves to damage these. And this leads to neuropathy. And you know what else? It also loves to damage the retina. So it particularly, it accumulates within the retina. And when it accumulates in the retina, it leads to a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. And that causes like a, particularly like night blindness and visual changes. And it can even cause cataracts, but these are the three big ones. It also accumulates within the skin tissue and leads to ichthyosis. Okay? It also accumulates within the epiphyseal plates and affects the actual growth of the epiphyseal plates and causes dysplasia of the epiphyseal plates. So we call this epiphyseal dysplasia. But you know what's actually really interesting about this? The, you know, your exams love to give you a classical kind of like uh, buzzword term. And this causes, whenever you have dysplasia of the epiphyseal plates, the toe, the fourth toe doesn't actually grow correctly. And so because of that, this causes shortening of the fourth toe. Very important thing there. So that covers Refsum's disease. All right, this next condition is called adrenal leukodystrophy. This is an X-linked recessive, an X-linked recessive disorder. And what happens is because it's X-linked, it's going to be more common in which type of sex? Males or females? Males. So because of that, remember that this will have more of a, a predominance within males. The next thing is that if this is X-linked recessive, it leads to the loss of expression of a particular type of gene called, uh, well, the ABCD1 gene. And that gene basically encodes for that protein, the ABCD1 protein. Remember that protein, the ABCD1 protein brings in the very long chain fatty acids and the branch chain fatty acids. It brings it into the peroxisome so that they can be metabolized. Well, if these aren't brought in, what happens? They're not able to get metabolized. And because of that, these very long chain fatty acids and branch chain fatty acids start to accumulate within inside of the tissues. What tissues? It accumulates within the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system and the adrenal cortex. When it accumulates here, it really loves to cause damage to your actual central nervous system. And it commonly leads to dementia, okay, and progressive neurodegeneration. The other thing that's very interesting is it loves to accumulate within the adrenal cortex. And when it accumulates within the adrenal cortex, do you guys remember the hormones that are made by your adrenal cortex? The two big ones, by the zona glomerulosa and the zona fasciculata. That is aldosterone. That'll have significant decreased production. And cortisol. That'll also have significant decreased production. Why is this dangerous? Because in children, if this is very, very low, these levels, this can lead to what's called adrenal crisis which can be very fatal. So very, very, very important thing to remember here. Okay, so that covers adrenal leukodystrophy and therefore the paroxysomal disorders. All right, engineers, so in this video, we talk about paroxysomes and the associated paroxysomal disorders. I hope it made sense and I hope that you guys did like it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.